Hey, welcome to this Business Spotlight Series. I'm certified leadership and business coach here in Columbus, Ohio. Today, I've got with me Evan Schroeder. He's the uh, owner and originator of Combat CSP as my guest. Uh, today, we're going to talk about his business, some of his challenges, some of his successes, best practices, and to give you a, a peek into what it's really like um, to build a business and to operate a business on a daily basis. If this is your first time on the channel, please be sure to like and subscribe so that you can get further information and notifications every time we drop a new conversation with a new business owner just like Evan. So Evan, welcome to the show today. Thank you for being here. Um, if you would, just start us out a little bit and give us a, a very brief overview of your background and a little bit about what Combat CSP is all about. Yeah, so um, I guess my background um, is I from Ohio. Um, I grew up around the Columbus area. I went to the Ohio State University and graduated from the Fisher College of Business, uh, and I specialized in marketing. Uh, shortly after I got my first job out of college, I realized I needed to be my own boss. I needed to be an entrepreneur, and um, I had an opportunity to capitalize on when I was uh, in the construction world. And I saw a pretty big problem with uh, weak floors on construction sites, uh, more temporary flooring. They're not the final floor. And uh, when people would bring those heavy materials onto those soft floors, um, I noticed that those carts were starting to puncture through those floors and actually tip that weight over. And uh, so I just thought I could solve that problem. It seems like a pretty easy PSI problem to solve. And uh, now we're here. Awesome. Awesome. So tell us a little bit about uh, how, what, the, what are the product you've said what the product does, but what are the products that Combat CSP does? Yeah, so the combat or the products that we do, so to speak, are trying to bridge the gap between safety and efficiency. Um, awesome. From my experience, what I've noticed uh, is there's a pull uh, between, you know, the safer you are, the less efficient you are. Um, and the more efficient you are, you tend to sacrifice safety. Um, and I want to be able to bridge that gap to make safety efficient. And so our products, we have Combat Mat, Hallway Hero, uh, and we just launched our third product, the Rock Slide, all aim to make the end user's life um, safer and uh, more efficient at what they do. Super. So with this creation of those products and the business to deliver those products to your customer, Tell me a little bit about the role that you play in the business today. So today, um, I guess my biggest role is customer facing uh, and vendor facing. So I build partnerships with uh, vendors who supply our materials. And then I also uh, am the one out in the field, um, you know, making sure the end user is happy uh, using the product as well as gaining more insight into what issues they face. Um, and then I guess I'm the liaison between, uh, you know, once we actually get the sale, making sure all the back end team, uh, you know, knows what they're doing, keeping our books up to date, making sure we're hitting deadlines with, uh, you know, taxes and stuff like that. So um, my biggest role today is customer facing and sales, um, as well as uh, making sure the back end process uh, stays up to date so we can remain scalable. Yeah, super, super. So both of those are working in the business, making sure that the business is functioning and you're still here six months from now. Um, how much time in an average day or an average week would you say that you're able to step out of the in the business and assume your role as the owner of the business and look at things like strategy and forward planning and envisioning what 2025 and beyond may be? I'd say nowadays, I'd say about 75% of my time can be like that. Um, I actually awesome. choose to, yeah, uh, I'm actually really proud of that. Before it was like, uh, maybe on a Sunday, I could think about that kind of thing. Um, but nowadays, I probably daydream about where the company's going um, very often. And uh, it makes it a lot more fun when you can uh, turn those daydreams into a reality and uh, implement a strategy that you've been wanting to for months. Um, the other 25%, I would say, um, 
is like answering, you know, you have to be that customer facing rep. You want to mm -hmm. make sure that uh, the brand stays um, up to the customer standard. So we pride ourselves on quality uh, and making sure they don't have to do a lot of work. Say they want to, you know, have they have a maintenance issue, which really doesn't happen with our products, but we want to make sure that, um, you know, very fast replies uh, and very low burdensome on, you know, the end user. Okay, super. Thank you. You've uh, you've hit on a couple of things that I wanted to bring out from you because they do make your company unique. Um, it, you know, number one is you said, "Hey, customer complaints or customer service uh, when it comes to the product failing, that's just not part of your business model because your product doesn't fail." Um, I think that's very, very unique. I think uh, this, the bridging between the safety and the efficiency is absolutely unique. And uh, I know in our previous conversation, you had shared with me that there really isn't any competition for you. The competition is really in your customer's mind is do they or don't they with you? So in, in that area of uniqueness, um, how much of your sales time is really educating people on your product versus the closing the deal? Uh, that's a really great question. Um, I think now that um, I think the best way to answer this question would be kind of some comparison. Um, so about three years ago, uh, it was all about educating, uh, all about letting them demo the product uh, and making sure I'm part of the demo. So, uh, you know, there's no misinformation about how it should be used or, uh, you know, what its capabilities are. And it was all about education. And now, three years later, we're more to the point where we've built this, uh, one, we built this trust with a large amount of customers. And uh, so once we, because of that trust, uh, what we say basically is fact with our product. If we say our product is this, they know it's going to do that. And what it ha what ha has happened from that is those customers are now educating others for us. So really, it's a lot of referrals. Uh, it's a lot more time just to kind of like taking the order uh, and then being done with it. Um, we still like to build those relationships with people who are educated and, you know, new prospects. But a lot of times they know they know what they want because they heard it from some friends. So there's not really too much education uh, anymore. Okay, yeah. super. Now, I, I know from talking with you, but let's bring the audience in on your little secret here is how many people have you had? How many people, employees do you have in the company now? And what's your vision for next year? Um, so I guess right now I'm the only, technically, I'm the only employee on payroll. Um, and then I have probably about four or five kind of 1099s. Um, my wife is actually probably the most involved 1099. Um, I actually asked her to quit her real estate career to help me out. And I'm very grateful that she did. Um, and then I have, you know, those other 1099s who are more on the back end, you know, uh, placing the purchase orders, uh, keeping the book straight. So um, I'm sorry, I, I want to... Um, so is that answer, that was the first part of the question, like who's that, the team? Yeah, that's the first part of the question of what got you here. Now, what does the future look like for for you? Are you going to stay at that level or are you looking at expanding people? Honestly, I think that's a really hard question because I'd say the vision where I want to take the company is going to require people um, okay. However, I have the mindset of, you know, the more cooks in the kitchen, kind of like the bigger the headache. And so I think I've found a very lean team. Um, and mm -hmm. I think in the near future, this team of mine, uh, we can get a lot done and we can scale a very a tremendous amount without even having to bring more people involved. Uh, so really the, what the vision entails is just launching and creating more products. Um, and then, that will allow us to test the like kind of the limits of what this you know lean team can handle so far. So right now, I don't plan on bringing anyone else on board. Um, I just want to launch new products and solve more problems for these guys out in the field. So. Now it, that uh, absolutely, and the size and the success of your company that's uh, admirable. I mean, to be a virtual solopreneur 
and to be as successful as you are. That's fabulous. But share with the audience a little bit. What's what's the toll been on you personally? Uh, so I guess uh, this past year, um, the toll has been a lot less as we kind of discussed, but um, really the toll for like the last, you know, starting this company up until, you know, this past year, not even realizing or being aware of what I was doing to my health uh, and realizing the impact that stress can have and what stress can manifest into. Um, I think there's, there's kind of like a joke that I've seen online with, um, you know, are you a founder type of manager or are you kind of like a more hands-off? Are you trying to get out of the company? And I was definitely one of those founder managers where mm -hmm. I didn't really, when I gave somebody a role and I even trained them on a role, I wouldn't let them do it because, you know, I was trying to, but I would, I'd be so strict or so like determined on this certain way because they weren't able to see all these other things that I had on the back end. And um, that type of management really locked me into a toxic work uh, life balance, mm -hmm. you know, working when you didn't want to work. And then I wasn't able, I wasn't even aware how to shut off my brain. I wasn't able to switch tasks. Um, and that stress was just so strong. Um, and being able to work with my wife and um, kind of identify ways to, you know, start including hobbies again, start focusing on health and food, other interests, uh, you know, what you call uh, work-life harmony, um, I think is the biggest win out of everything I've done so far. And um, I'm actually, that's probably the most proud thing I, I have to like speak for is being able to find that harmony, because uh, it's so important. That's fabulous. And I, I appreciate you sharing that story with everybody, because we all, everybody wakes up in the middle of the night, oh my goodness, uh, stressing over things. And, and once you learn how to, number one, identify those triggers, and then two, how to relieve those triggers, then you have opened up your life to be able to be more successful. You know, on the journey that you're on right now, um, I, I like to coach on the entrepreneurial ladder and that is in, in construction, you know what a ladder is. Every time you step up a rung, you get a little higher and you get to see a little bit more. Um, the ultimate destiny, if you have a ladder, the reason that you have a ladder is you need to get up high. In a business, in, in the cycle of business, college, high school, our entire educational system is designed to create employees. And that's the first rung, okay? You had this entrepreneurial hiccup in college and said, yeah, no, I don't care what they educated me in. I'm going to be my own boss. Congratulations. That moves you up to the next rung, which is self-employed. When you have people around you, all of a sudden, it's not just self-employed of how do I make my vision successful? But then the next level up is becoming a manager. And that's a completely different, you know, as a self-employed, I don't need leadership. All I have to do is talk to myself in the mirror. I don't need sales because I'm sales. I don't need back room because I'm back room. But as you add people, then you have to become a mentor, a teacher, a guide, a manager, and even a leader. And those are additional skills to be able to use other people's time to row the canoe for you. You know, if you're in a kayak, you can move pretty quickly in a one-man kayak. You get into a two-person canoe, and now you got to be coordinated to get that thing to move. You get into a large rowing shell, and you have more and more and more people, and they all have to be rowing in the same direction in the same time. That's what management is at a business level. The next level up from that is some of the things that you've started to share with me and some of the things that you talk to me about in the future. And that was when we first talked, your company had two products, now you have three. You know, you shared with me some other ventures that you're looking at. As you move forward, the next level up is a director level. And that's where you have more time to look out to the future, look out to the horizon and see what else you can do. And the people are now doing the 80% of the rest of the business and you're using their time. After that becomes the owner. And then after the owner gets the business working to a point where it's profitable and it runs without you for the most part, um, then you get into 
being the fun part of being able to look at investments. You know, do I invest in growing this company? Do I invest in the stock market? Do I invest in real estate? But each of those levels is the rung on that level is a change and it's a change in mindset. You know, being highly successful where you are is, is a wonderful place. One of these days you're going to realize um, if you haven't already, you know, what happens if I wanted to take a, a month off? You know, who's doing your sales? Who's doing your back room? That's the next level of growth in the company. That will take you not only 30% growth, 50% growth, but that's where your company goes to 3x, 10x. And so it, it, you, you, you have the base fundamentals already, which is fabulous where you are right now. You could take your company and double and triple it, but it's going to take more people and you can't do it just a little. If you do it your, yourself, you're trading your time for your money. Okay. The next level up is to trade other people's time for your money. But you've you know, established a, a huge first foundation right there. You know, what's really interesting is uh, kind of the, the latter example that you're talking about. There's a great mentor that I've worked with. Um, and I still call him from time to time. His name is Neil Collins. Um, he runs Innovate New Albany uh, here right outside of Columbus. And uh, he ingrained in my brain and, and he didn't really, I don't think he meant to, but he always talked about taking the right steps in the right order. And I think that was one thing that I really struggled with is, you know, I would read all these books on mindset or like, you know, the scalable business uh, mindset or this or that. And um, honestly, I would read these books without even having a business and I would read these mm -hmm. books in college and, um, it kind of created what I realized is it would create a sense of ego almost, because if I was doing the sales, uh, it almost was a direct, it was almost like a slap in the face in my mind because I'm like, I shouldn't be running. I shouldn't be in the business because in my mind, I was like, I need to be out of the business. And so I realized like, I was skipping ahead. I skipped all these steps right to like telling myself like I should yep. be out of the business, but then wait, there is no business to start. And so I think I learned having fun at each of these phases, you know, not getting ahead of myself and taking the right step or having the right mindset in the right order is incredibly important. And I think that can go a long way for a lot of people uh, just being able, not being scared to elevate your mindset, but also not being afraid to, you know, take your ego and like, you know, maybe refrain it a little bit and be like, hey, you're not here yet. Uh, it's okay to be here. So, uh, it, you know, I, I I hear what you're saying, Evan, and I kind of take that as you're, uh, you're justifying yourself in tapping the brakes. And I don't see you tapping the brakes at all. What I see is you had this vision of where you wanted to go, but you realized, huh, um, I probably should focus on the sales first, how I like to do it, and then somehow capture that best practice of what I want, the content and the context, the, the spirit of the sales that is combat CSP. And then be able to teach that so someone else can have that. You know, for, for me, um, you know, playing baseball as a kid, pure joy of playing baseball. It really lived that joy when I was able to help my son play baseball and watch him experience success on the field. You know, so it's a different level. It's, uh, it, you know, you, you move through life, you move through business, and yes, you get one level of gratification for doing it yourself. And then there's another level for having other people be able to do it. And then the third level after that is when someone can actually do it better than you. And you realize now we've got a business because I've surrounded myself with people that can do things better than me. I think you're off to a great start there. And I think that it's it's not a tap in the break. It's, yes, I need to master these pieces before I build up. You know, no one builds a house by starting with the roof. You got to start with the foundation first and go up. You don't build the roof first and then come down. So, I, mm -hmm. I, you know, again, it's all a matter of semantics, maybe, or just your vision. But I think you're on the right path.
you know, in fact, from that coming next, um, where do you see your business in three to five years? Well, um, is my is our connection still good? Am I laggy or anything? Okay. Um, uh, you said, where do we see? I see the business in three to five years. Yeah. <laughs> in three to five years, um, I see, you know, product line, you know, either from like six to about 20 different products. Uh, I know that's a wide range, um, but it really depends like on cash flow, you know, what we can actually mm -hmm. uh, roll out. And so, you know, if any of our product ideas fail, then it'll probably be on the lower end. Uh, but if they're mostly successful, which we've seen a lot of more success than failures at this point, um, then I think it'll be around like the higher 20-ish mark. Um, and then I would probably want to exit um, and work on something uh, bigger. Um, not bigger, but more just like I want to, you know, get into other uh, markets um, mm -hmm. and uh, be able to take the the money from the exit and uh, maybe do some other things that could impact the industry in a different way. So awesome. Awesome. Super. When you, uh, when you look at that type of future goal in three to five years, what's your approach to goal setting? Uh, you know, what, what, uh, what direction do you go and just tell me a little bit about how you set that. I mean, it's kind of easy when it's just you, but you mentioned your wife and uh, you may not have been around the sun as many times as I have, but I have learned that no one in the world can read my mind if I don't write it down and let people know what I want to achieve. They can't help me. But what's your approach to setting goals? Um, so I'd say I, I do when I've set goals, actually, my uh, wife, uh, we do quarterly um, goal check ins. Uh, we, you know, we have like the five year goal. We have like the one year goal and um, you know, the quarterly goals, the weekly uh, mm -hmm. and every quarter we do a review together. But uh, so I will communicate with her what those goals are. Um, and, you know, we keep each other accountable, um, whether they're business related or not. But in terms of this big three to five year goal of increasing the product line and then exiting, um, the goal is really, you know, we, we take that and we break it down to, you know, what is needed um, to actually accomplish that. So is it a great engineering team? Um, is it a combination of, you know, several things? And, um, you know, I think as it breaks down, you get down to, you know, what would make this attract attractive to an investor who wants to buy you out. And to me, that is uh, easy systems, documentation on reasoning, um, and, you know, healthy, organized books, uh, like, you know, on the accounting side, like bookkeeping. And I think the goal is not just like, go, 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 you know, let's pump it out. The goal is, Let's do, let's keep going. Let's document everything. Let's keep things organized and let's keep it simple. Uh, so, you know, it could be acquired one day. So Awesome. Super. Does that answer so in that area, you, it, it does. It does. In, in the area of the goals, do you have them? For me, at my generation, we wrote them down. Younger generation, I don't know, maybe you record them video, but is there a, a recording or a record of what goals you are and how far you've progressed towards that goal? Uh, yeah, we do written goals. Uh, we have journals. Uh, you know, we have several different notebooks, uh, depending on what the type of goal it is. Um, I wouldn't say we have like progress bars or anything like that, but it's more like uh, bullet points and check like checklists um and then uh deadlines okay um so we and we do have like numbers to it like we do smart goals um and yeah it's all well documented uh in handwritten mm -hmm. journals so. super and uh how many goals do you work on at any one time i'd say about three uh, macro goals is what I would call them. Um, and then those macro goals, um, can be split down into three, you know, goals themselves. So you you'll have nine, um, and you can work on those throughout the year, but it's important to have, um, three macro goals that are kind of different categories of like life. Uh, so you'd have a business goal, mm -hmm. maybe a health goal, 
um, and then like a hobby goal. Um, so we don't just focus on, you know, just the business schools, but, it's, you know, three different categories. You can do six different categories, but um, it's just one big goal and then break it down a little bit and then get out, set some deadlines, try to grow from there. Super. Uh, one last question on goal setting. I know we've drilled down deep, but if you've answered everything. And, and I would say that you are uh, definitely a model for the audience to be listening to how you progress through this and how you keep everybody on track. When it comes to goals, I know several years ago, my own personal coach um, had a philosophy. If I know what needs to be done and how to do each of those steps it, to do, put it on the to-do list, schedule it out on my calendar and check it off. Uh, challenged me and, and continues to challenge me every time I set my goals and set the new ones after that is, is there some level, if in other words, is there a gap someplace in my knowledge, in my, my ability, in whatever the case may be but if there's a gap that requires me to grow then he he checks off and says yep that's a great goal for you rick How, what's, what's your view of the goals um you know it's really funny that you say that um that it, it's honestly some uh my wife and i joke that uh you know the brain or the magnets are clicking when um you know, something, you know, you just connect the dots and something, something you just said connected the dots and, you know, the magnets are clicking, so to speak. Um, and that is when I would write down goals, I have a really big tendency to overcomplicate things, wanting to know all the details. Um, and it's just like, I just hyper focus into it. Uh, I make it way over comp or complicated. Um, and honestly, that was probably the biggest reason why I got stuck in the rabbit hole of, you know, working all day, every day for the beginning of the business. But um, what I, what you just said is you don't want to be able to have, if you can break down that goal, then one, it's probably not big enough. It doesn't challenge, um, you know, what you're trying to, it doesn't challenge you to grow. And when I put pen to paper, I always try to have that big goal and then I'll spend an hour trying to break it down. And it is the most painful process because I can't. And then it, that, and what you just said, but maybe that's the healthy part. Maybe that's where it's like, it's a good goal when you can't break it down. And uh, sometimes uh, Nikki and I's meetings will drag on because I'm stuck on trying to say like, okay, we're missing a step between these two things. Um, and she starts to get annoyed because she's like, Evan, you're overthinking it. Um, but anyways, I, what you just said there is a really good point. And uh, yeah, I'm glad well, you said it, that. You, you know, yeah. Well, super, super. Um, you know, sometimes the goal, the goal is not a direct approach. In fact, often it's not. Life is a procession. In order to get to my goal at point A, sometimes I have to go to point C to get to A. A, a simple ex. Uh, a simple example of that is driving your car. You look down at the speedometer, it says 50 and you want to be going 60. You can't concentrate on the speedometer and will it to go up. Okay, You have to physically use your muscles, right leg, push down on the accelerator to increase the car's speed. That's the law of procession. If I want more customers in my business, I really can't increase the number of customers directly. But what I can do in my goal is become better at marketing and better at sales. When I'm better at both of those, then I'll have more customers. So sometimes it's not simply breaking it down, but it's understanding what are the, the, the linear actions that I have to become better at to move up the Y scale to achieve my goal. So yeah. listen, we have uh, we've really dug a lot into that. And I appreciate you uh, being willing to do this journey with me on those goals, because I do believe you've got a good focus on it 
And I think that focus has changed immensely and it's going to continue to change as you continue to grow your, your business. And we've certainly covered a lot of ground in our conversation today. And for those watching, I highly encourage you to save this. Evan's got a huge amount of nuggets here and I really think it would be worth it to you to go back a few times, watch it additionally and gain what those are. As we wrap up today, I'd like to move into the final section, which I call rapid fire questions. These are just top of your mind type of uh, answers, Evan, short answers. You ready for this part? Uh, I'm ready. Super. What would you call or, or what is the key to your success? I'd say um, having a not having a goal that's monetary. Uh, you know, if your goal is driven on money, uh, you know, some of the biggest orders I've gotten, um, you know, I was having a bad day at some of my biggest orders that I've received and that money didn't change anything. Um, and so that's just an example. You know, your goal should not always be tied to money amounts. It should be derived from, you know, you have an enjoyment doing it and uh, that way you don't burn out and it keeps things fun. You're having fun. You're going to do great things. Awesome. Thank you. Next question is what piece of advice, what one piece of advice would you give to other business owners that are in the same stage as you? Um, yeah, that's a hard one. One piece of advice. I would, I would just say, I would encourage you to um, not let the uh, failures, uh, if you can change your mindset, you know, failures are opportunities to grow um, rather than, you know, just because you make so many mistakes and you're, the people you work with are going to make mistakes and uh, making it more fun and treating it as like a game and, um, you know, realizing it's not the end of the world. Uh, don't, beat yourself down so to speak you cannot be so hard on yourself where um you know mistakes you know increase your heart rate <laughs> you know just laugh it off uh and move mm -hmm. on you know learn from it and just get over it you know evan if i can share with you from my experience as a coach i've been doing this for 17 years when your answer to that one question becomes more natural and comfortable to you you'll be ready and open to hiring in more people and having them work for you. When you have to think about it, that's a, an indication that you personally, the six inches between your ears, you're not quite ready to bring on that team and have them help you to be successful. You're close, okay? But consider that, that that's the goal right there is if you could become more comfortable and natural with that question. Next quick question. You've mentioned a couple of resources, a couple of people. What one book is really, or one book, one article, one TED Talk, any of those, what one that you have read most recently is top of mind right now? Honestly, the biggest one that started the whole mindset shift was reading Rich Dad, Poor Dad by Robert Kiyosaki. Um, I'm not condoning, you know, like, you have to buy the book. It was just from my experience, Robert uh, Rich Dad Poor Dad is a great foundational mindset book for business awesome. owners. Super. Yep. I've got that in my inventory, and that's one that I recommend as well. Super. If there was, if you had to choose only one company, or I'm sorry, back up again. If you had to choose only one area of your business that you could immediately improve when you wake up Monday morning, what would that area be? I'd say the area of business that handles taxes. Um, and that's because there's a huge, so I guess the accounting department, uh, not the bookkeeping and the accounting, but with me, there's always a uh, fear that the I, you're going to get audited and, you know, you just might want to make sure everything is right. And so maybe everything I'm doing is right, but I'd say just having relief from, you know, thinking you're doing something wrong every time, you go to do taxes. I just that it's hard to get out of that fear mindset. Like you, you know, you're screwing something up. So 
uh, or you're going to get audited five years down the line and you're going to have a huge tax bill you didn't know about. So I don't know if that's necessarily a department, but I would love to you know, have that straightened out or that ease. Super. Yep. Yeah. 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 You're, you're not alone. There are many other people that, uh, you know, this time of year, I usually start way back in September and helping and guiding my clients to be prepared for year end so that we're not living in that type of fear. Well, Evan, if there was a way that the audience, if someone is watching this video right now and wants to be your next customer for one of your products, what's the best way for them to get in touch with you? Uh, definitely uh, via email, um, which I'm sure we could probably post on the video. Uh, Absolutely, yes. Okay. Uh, but yeah, via email, um, not by calling because 90% of calls are spam. So I don't really answer that too much. Uh, email for sure. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. So final question. What most inspires you today? Uh, I'd say the biggest thing that inspires me is being able to help those in similar kind of like when you like uh, kind of what you're doing, uh, coaching those kind of that you've experienced, you've been in their shoes before in some way or another. Something that really inspires me is when people come to me asking for advice on, you know, if they're having skin issues, uh, you know, I had really bad eczema. Um, I love being able to help those types of people. And same thing with business. Maybe they're stressing out. Maybe they don't know the difference between working direct versus uh, distribution. So being able to help those that are trying to grow that have already kind of grown past, um, I absolutely love that. And it's very motivating for me to kind of keep going because I know it's going to, you know, people are also going the same direction. And I'd love to be able to help those people. up. So. Super, super. Thank you, Evan. Hey, Evan, thank you so much for being part of this and joining us today, sharing your journey and giving us an insight into your own path to success and the costs that you've had to pay and the the obstacles that you have overcome to get to be where you are. I think that's a fabulous story. And audience, thank you so much for watching again. You never know who might be inspired by listening to this today or who's out there in the audience that may take what you've done and say, hey, I have that problem too. And now I know how to overcome it. So everybody, Thank you again for tuning in today. Make it a great day and bye for now.